Okay, so now let's look at what actually happens when we sample. Okay. First and simplest thing I can do is I can just, you know, draw random numbers, and in this case, I'll just get some numbers between zero and one. This is your run of the mill of vanilla, you know, uniform random number generator running on a CPU or GPU fairly efficiently. It's probably not the most statistically or cryptographically pure random number generator, but one that's fairly fast. So, but anyway, so that's what you get. I guess nothing interesting to be seen here. Now, if I wanted to get random integers, well, I could do that too. And, you know, that's invoked by rand int. And so now you get numbers between, in this case, one and 100, or actually one and 99. And lo and behold, I actually get one twice. Let's just see. Okay. Get something else now. Okay. So nothing particularly special here. Um, this is the picture that we saw before, but now actually implemented. Okay, let's explain what's going on. So <coughs> I'm just picking, you know, 100 bins. I'm doing some, you know, just plotting, remangling. And I'm going to generate random integers between 0 and 99. And, okay, basically, yeah, so I'm starting it off by, yeah, like that. Now, what I'm essentially doing is, I'm, if I is in the appropriate bin, then, you know, go and add the count. Otherwise, and then, you know, if the count, you know, if my counter is between 10, 100, and 1,000, and so on, I just go and, you know, plot this thing. So what I did here, just for reference, I don't even bother pulling out random ran int explicitly and then checking the entry. I'm just indexing this directly, right? So counts of run rand int just goes directly into that field and it increments it by one. Okay, so if, for instance, that value is three, then it increments the bin that has value three. Why do we have to go from zero to 99? Well, because it's Python. It starts all the indices from zero. And then we can see that as, you know, we sample more and more for, you know, a million terms, well, we get something that's fairly smooth, but for, you know, 10, it's not so nice. Okay, any questions so far? Good. Um, I can do things like categorical distributions, right? <coughs> so in this case, I'm just looking at two possible outcomes, you know, zero and one. And what I'm doing is I'm picking an interval between zero and one, right? And if the random variable is below 0.35, then I say it's outcome zero, otherwise it's outcome one. Okay. So I just hand engineer that sampler. Okay. It's a pretty boring sampler. I mean, it's like tossing a bias coin. And then I go and compute that thing again, right? So I basically just run this. Um, and yeah, I'm just checking for each of the random variables, you know, a million of those, whether they are, you know, less or larger than 0.35. I'm doing this in bulk here. That's a lot faster than a for loop. But I guess from homework one, by now everybody knows that for loops are evil, <laughs> right? And then let's plot this. And so if you plot the corresponding pro fractions, I mean, they all have to sum up to one, you can see that, you know, this wiggles around a bit and eventually it goes to 0.35 and 0.65 as you would expect. Okay. <coughs> Now, okay, last but not least, the normal distribution, and this is how you plot one, right? This is just, you know, 
creating range between minus 10 and 10, grid spacing 0 0.01. Then you evaluate this function here. You plot it, and that's it, right? Nothing particularly special. Except that now, what we're going to do is, we're going to actually try out how, what our, random, uh, our central limit theorem does. So I'm going to create a ran random variable, which is zero with what probability? Exactly, because if it's less than 0.3, I don't get anything. What's the probability that that random variable is one? So the exciting in, an interesting line is this one here, right? What's the probability that the value is uh, one? You can also read it off in the code, right? Okay, well, so temp is some, you know, random numbers, and they are between zero and one. Right. And I created, you know, some big array of that. You know, I basically created 10 instances of, you know, 10,000 samples. And now I'm checking for each entry in temp whether it's greater than 0.3. Okay. So therefore, for all the terms where it's not greater than 0.3, well, okay, it's zero. Now for all the entries where it's greater than 0.8, well, basically two inequalities kick in in the same time. So with probability, therefore 0.2, it's two, and with probability 0 0.5, it's one. There was a question over there. Oh, uh, I was gonna answer your question. Oh, okay. And, okay, sorry, I didn't see you before, I apologize. So this, by the way, is just, is also the answer to the question, right? It's 0 0.5 times one, plus 0 0.2 times two. And now, this is actually just computing the variance as we would, right? This was exactly the decomposition that we had before. So it's 0 0.5 times one squared and 0 0.2 times two squared, which is four, minus mean squared, okay? Then we can go and print this. And then, well, okay, we do a little bit of maintenance here. We essentially just aggregate terms and divide them by the counts. Okay, let's just do this. Now let's print it. So we, on this plot, you can see um, 10 executions of that average. And you can see that they're all pretty much converging to one, which just so happens to be the average here. Well, close to one. But then the other thing is you, you'll see the upper and the lower bound. So look at that, that slide carefully because it'll help you for the homework. Okay, and with that, we're done with the notebook.